So yes, I met Jess at two different entomology conferences, Social Insect Conference in San Diego, and then the Entomological Society of America meetings in Vancouver. And you'll have the great pleasure of meeting three of the five people at this table within the semester, because Tierney Brocious will be joining you for a future class. And maybe I'll jump in because I love her uh, I love her approaches to entomology, including insects and fashion. And here is where you come into play. Just sent me this whiteboard full of your first inklings of the projects you'd like to pursue. This is also the last slide of this presentation because I'd like to end with thinking with you about your projects, if you have time, if you'd like to, because I've left this evening night open if you'd like to pursue. And by the by, interrupt me. Jess will tell you, I really love tangents. I love interruptions, redirections. And I'd like to follow through on aspects that really interest you individually. So please don't hesitate to speak up or yell out or say, hey, how'd you do that? Or why is that important? Or how would it benefit me? Okay. So I want to start by thinking about, since we're all scientists, what we have aesthetically at our disposal to convey concepts, to forward our science. We do have tables, alphanumeric rows, columns, right? And that can be very helpful. We also have charts, uh, say life cycles, things like that. And we have XY plots. All of these are useful. All of them are quite abstract. I'd argue some of the most valuable imagery in any area of science tends to be the least abstract, tends to be illustrations, photographs, manipulated digitizations. And so that's what I'm going to focus on for this period and think about the value, the power of science, like Copernicus, 16th century. Here is his idea, not of a uh, an Earth-centered universe, but challenging Catholic dogma, a heliocentric solar system. And there we are, just the third planet out from the sun, less important than we thought we might be. So he, he literally redirected or made us face new thoughts about where we stand in the universe. Now, of course, the the uh, rotations around the sun aren't perfect concentric circles, so some of that's wrong, but some of it's right. Da Vinci, changing our thoughts about lunar properties, water properties, embryonic development. Vesalius and his anatomical illustrations, breaking away from using pig carcasses to better understand human anatomy. And the, then you've got Micrographia with Robert Hooke's illustrations and writings. Here's a flea, and this was really key during the time of Samuel Pepys' diaries. He even included Black Plague and this visual of uh, a flea. And then you've got Ernst Haeckel, which really made us view the beauty and diversity of life through visuals. And finally, a type of imaging that was new to the world, Röntgen, uh, uh, really discovered x-rays. And there is his wife's hand with a wedding ring. And he won the Nobel Prize for that. So a new way to look at the universe. And then, of course, the most famous doodle in all of biology was in one of Charles Darwin's notebooks, which, by the by, was apparently stolen last year. So it no longer exists in the archives where it did in the UK. But here it is. The, that doodle is a visual metaphor for the relatedness of life and evolution. So I've had at least two students come up to me with tattoos with I think and then the tree of relatedness. It ended up being the only figure in On the Origin of Species in 1859. That's how important this metaphor was. And Ernst Haeckel, among many others, obsessed over the idea of the tree, even though his tree is actually less meaningful because most of the information is in the trunk there. He took a more literal interpretation of the tree of life. And we can think about biomedical research. My identical twin brother, Arno Klein, does 
brain imaging. And there are lots of different ways to look at that three pound wonder in our cranium. And so he looks at the morphology, he looks at pathology in many different visual ways. Elizabeth Tibbetts in Ann Arbor, Michigan, University of Michigan, looks at facial recognition in wasps. So we might not think one wasp looks terribly different than the next wasp, but tell that to the wasps. They're looking at all these little black patches or yellow across the faces and hierarchies form. Status and rank is based on recognition. So visuals are very important in her research. Cornelia hesse Huniger, she was a scientific illustrator, an artist, but she also became, uh, say, a collaborative scientist, an environmental activist, because she would discover true bugs and other insects and even some plants in the vicinity, even of the cleanest nuclear power plants being mutated. And she claims that bilateral asymmetries are due to the radiation from Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, but again, those that haven't melted down. So I'm gonna throw a question out there. When do you think illustration specifically is useful to visualize a subject. And some of you probably produce illustrations or have included illustrations in your work or have thought about it. Why? Why not a photograph? Why not always a photograph? For example, thoughts. Uh, just yell it out, Adriana. So one, one really common use of illustrations is in sort of fossil ecosystem reconstructions Good. um and i guess more broadly sometimes even both in paleontology but also sometimes in more like paleo environmental work where the focus is on the environment rather than the organisms when you're working in the past you can't directly photograph a landscape it's been altered through geologic past the, the geological processes but it's often you know you will use an illustration to uh illustrate what you imagine or what you infer based on the evidence that you the, the evidence that you're presenting that's right and there's some danger there right so there's artistic license and in that artistic license there's a gray area of unknowns and i used to work at a natural history display making studio and at the american museum of natural history making exhibits and some of those involved uh fossil uh recreations for Devonian period and other periods that are long gone. So to recreate them, we have some evidence, but not all the evidence. And we can talk about that a lot more. Others. So this is something that just can't be seen, right? From the past, unless you have a TARDIS. Anybody else? Um, I guess continuing from that, can anyone hear me? Yeah, Horace, yeah. Yeah, um, so I guess continuing from that, uh, it can also be helpful for when photographs um, are sort of unclear. Like Good. I also work with fossils and the ones I work with are, um, uh, they're sometimes difficult to make out from the rock and photographs. Um, and there's also the, the matter of creating a sort of generalized illustration of something mm. with a lot of variation. Um, so, you know, it's sort of like a template that you can look at and compare what you have in photographs to. Spot on on both counts, Horace. You've got the value in highlighting salient features, uh, as well as, as you say, generalizing something. Maybe you've got an ab aberrant, unusual, exceptional fossil among many. If you want to create um, a composite, if you want to create uh, an animated recreation, you need something more, right? So that's perfect. And that can be an amber inclusion, that can be uh, uh, from Solnhofen, whatever it may be in sedimentary layers, you might not be able to see things clearly. Now, of course, I would recommend showing the photograph with the illustration so that there isn't too grave a bias. You want the original material usually beside the illustration as well. 
other thoughts, other ways that illustrations can be especially important. And I'm not ta- I'm not exclusively talking about um, manual pen and ink illustrations. It can be computer graphic, uh, generated imagery, whatever an illustration can mean. So, so this is sort of related to the um, the like reconstructions idea, but it's like maybe a little bit distinct, at least in my head, where in uh, in my my fields are in like people often have like a like a cartoon, which what visually for you is a cartoon, it's just sort of a simplified schematic of like yeah. like in this this period, you know this place was like this and it's often you have like a cross section of like an ocean basin or like sometimes a cross section of the earth or whatever and then you're sort of visually depicting a a physical physical differences in some you know physical or chemical parameter using um using you know colors and lines and all that in a way that's sort of spatially resolved but is obviously very simplified and uh, this is usually uh, sort of used to to visualize like a hypothesis or a yes. uh, or your sort of your sweeping conclusions that you're drawing from a particular body of work. Um, so it's kind of like the landscape reconstruction, but a bit more simplified and um, and larger scale, generalized, and not perhaps less literal. Perfect. Yeah, I love that. So simplification, composite imagery could be a cutaway. Uh, it could be pulling from different environments to have a generalized overview. Any other thoughts? Uh, I guess one more. So I'm thinking more specifically about sort of like in biology textbooks, those um, those drawings of like cells. Um, you know, maybe it's just too small to get a photograph of, or maybe like it's not distinct enough and you got to have it labeled, um, right. you know, and I think those can be, like, illustrations can be really helpful for that purpose. Well done. So I worked on an exhibit called Epidemic and what I did, and I'll show you an image of this later, but I made uh, HIV models. Well, when I was making HIV, these are 90 to 110 nanometers across, so they don't even reflect visible light. So the colors are made up. Um, but in order to see something at that scale and get a real um, accessible visualization of the exterior and interior, the RNA, the, uh, the cone that's inside the capsule inside a casahedral structure and the substrate uh, proteins, all of that, um, you really can't get a good grasp from what you'd call an actual image. So so creating 2D and 3D uh, schematic color versions of them can help. So too tiny made large enough to visualize. Those are all great. I'm going to give you a couple that overlap with what you've suggested, and we can explore more of this later. So one idea is when subjects are simply inaccessible. So there's a narwhal, <laughs> and few knew what that was like. And so uh, uh, so drawing an image from the tusk in a description, or the tooth in a description, and then Albrecht Durer never actually saw a rhinoceros before he produced that etching in the lower left. He was just given descriptions, right? Inaccessible. Um, and I was asked when I worked at Chase Studio making natural history displays, you can be separated by uh, time and distance from these, rendering them inaccessible. I was asked to make fossil draw drawings of all kinds of fossils like hylonymus this reptile and what was i given i was given um say a photograph of a really bad fossil and images of extant relatives of hylonymus okay that's something to go with but what do you color it how do you color it do you put um any kind of patterning on it i put a subtle suggestion but the rest is guesswork and then you can say when they're just not visible as you did, like here's an example, this is a cutaway, like the cutaway 
uh, that you were mentioning um, showing stratigraphy or something like that. Here's a cutaway of a bee's nest done by Camargo in 2003. Or like digital morphology in Austin, Texas, where you shoot high intensity x-rays. And as long as you have, say, density differences in an inclusion within a matrix, you can look at that 3D image, flip it around, slice it up. It's beautiful. An abstraction. Think about Darwin's metaphor for tree of life. Here's one by Zwickel and Hillis, where you have a circular phylogenetic diagram with us, Homo sapiens, embedded as a little dot arbitrarily right there. That's just one way of looking at the tree of life. There are other ways. This is a drawing by my mother, Karen Ann Klein, and she did a series of illustrations for another book I'm working on about sleep in non-human animals. And I asked her if she would draw a tree of life. And believe it or not, that's an accurate as best as we know with respect to the hypothesis of this phylogeny of vertebrates, invertebrates. This is the tree of animals. And all those representative organisms within metazoa known to sleep. So there are a lot of messages within that metaphorical tree. Some of them include how little we know. There are empty branches there. How Where we have biases, birds, mammals, et cetera. And then when salient features are important. So I was asked by David Rubick to draw a bunch of bees and bees' knees. And sure enough, the bees' knees are where it's at, at least with orchid bees. You've got this uh, group of bees in which the males collect um, odors from orchids, and then they uh, place them on tufts of seedy, the hair-like structures on their knees, and advertise to females. And so in order to distinguish among the species, you have to look at, it helps to look at these tufts. So salient features, really hard to see in photographs. When phenomena are, say, ephemeral, short-lived, and uh, also for David Rubick, that upper left one, um, I was talking to him about a behavior that hasn't been photographed, but he'd seen it's very short-lived, and he wanted me to illustrate it. And that's when this robber fly that mimics one species of orchid bee attacks a different species of real orchid bee. And another, another illustration by Camargo, you see pollinia attaching pollen grains to a bee that's visiting this flower. And then you can have a simultaneous display of information, a composite. And I did this illustration of an elephant dung pile with all these dung beetles. I call it dung dramas because Underneath this dung patty, all these different interactions are happening. Longhorn males are battling shorthorn males, but shorthorn males survive to reproduce because they have other strategies to get to females. Another composite I did in Central Park, New York City, with all this life, all these symbiotic associations at different scales. Now you could have a composite photograph, but some of them would be SEMs. It'd be, it'd be a hodgepodge, it'd be difficult. Uh, this is one I did with my mother for a book on evolution by uh, Egbert Lee recently. And this shows homology, shared common ancestry of structures of mouth parts across insect lineages. So what makes a labium, that lower lip? or that um, set of mouth parts there, what makes the labrum, the upper lip there. And it differs. Sometimes it doesn't exist in some lineages. So great diversification shown by a composite. Now, uh, Jess mentioned that I work on sleep biology, and I'm really excited about sleep in insects, but I do sleep in bats as well, and sleep in social insects especially. So when I look at honeybees, for example, can you see my cursor? Yeah? All right. Well, so there's a bee, and that worker bee I marked with a little metal shim. And 
a number of bees around her, eight in this still frame, are followers of the dance that she's about to perform. Now, she dances in order to advertise some resource. Maybe it's food, maybe it's a home site. The followers follow her dance. And here you see I'm highlighting not the dancer, but one of the followers. And if you follow that follower for a while, you'll see what she does. Now, if I sleep restricted that individual worker B, it'll affect the follower's behavior. In this case, the follower is following a bee that hasn't been sleep restricted. She had copper on her. So the magnets that I rolled across the hive did not wiggle her during the night and cause her to lose sleep. So this follower has left the dancer, followed enough, flips over and leaves. She'll exit the hive this way. That means she's going out to collect food. And I found out that those who were wiggled um, their followers leave to look for another dancer, probably with a better dance. So these are ways to visualize, and this is just simple infrared imaging, right? So it's like a security camera. Now, if I want to display that, I can display it a lot of different ways. One result I found was that depending on how imprecise the direction component of that dance was, if it ends up being more imprecise, the probability of exiting is going to be less. So more imprecise, less prospect of exiting to collect food. Well, okay, it, it takes a little bit for our minds to work through that XY plot. So I coupled it with an illustration in which I show that this dancer with copper and a precise directional component, her follower is going to exit the nest. But this one with steel that was wiggled and a wider, messier directional component to the dance, her follower is more likely to switch dances. So that visualization, at least I would hope, would convey the message more clearly. Although it's lacking the data that are in the graph. There are lots of ways to visualize everything, of course. And one study I conducted looked at sleeping bees and what they're thinking about or what's happening inside their brains. And this is calcium imaging. Over here, over here uh, are images of the antenna lobe of the brain. And this is calcium imaging with false coloration to show that regions of interest are activated when I present the bees with an odor. Another way to visualize, in this case, thermal imaging, you see this ball of bees, this hot ball of bees falling down. They are baking an invading wasp alive, as well as surrounding her in an envelope of CO2. So that wasp was suffocated and baked alive. And you can't see that very easily. But here, not only can you see it super clearly, in two frames of honeycomb with all these bees, this is the brood comb where the young are, but lighting up the hottest by far is this wasp death scene. And not only that, you can measure the temperatures, bee to bee, wasp to wasp, and parts of the, the wasps and bees. So this is, again, infrared imaging, and I did a cutaway of a hive so I could look at bees inserted in a cell. So this is a cell. Here's the head of a bee, the midsection, the hind section, and notice how she's pumping, pumping, pumping that hind section, and she is bright hot. Well, she's not sleeping. She's actually heating up adjacent brood. And I can tell thanks to this type of imaging. Here's another type of imaging. This is x-ray imaging of a wasp nest. And this was done with a student of mine, Liz Oldenburg. And this is really tricky because that paper is almost the same density as air. So trying to distinguish air from the paper in order to cut away with this 3D X-ray imaging was uh, took a lot of trial and error. So I'm going to show you several projects of mine 
visualization projects other than the thermal imaging and calcium imaging that I've used to create scientific illustrations. And I'll start with um, I'll start with a field guide to the damselflies. And this was the cover of different damselflies. So you could look at it and say, are those drawings? Are they photographs? They're really clean on a white background. How is that achieved? Because damselflies are basically these flying needles. And here's a view, just a snapshot of a screen when I was working on one of these damselflies. And so I'll have lists with information about them on the left, and then I'll zoom in on a composite that I've created, pulling from photographs and painting layer by layer by layer in Adobe Photoshop. So each damselfly might have uh, anywhere between seven layers and 50 layers on it. And that's the power of working with these visuals because you can change them on a dime. So you start out with something pretty dreadful, right? So you've got a, a dead damselfly. This one's actually in really good condition, but colors have faded. It's all bent out of shape. If you photograph that, it won't look really fabulous in a field guide. So what did we do? We disassembled each specimen. So 76 species of damselflies, males and females. We took a dead specimen from a collection, took them apart, scanned each part, and then cleaned them up digitally. So we wanted to make a dorsal view. We wanted to make a lateral view of males and females. So now you've got the cleaned up oriented parts from the scanned features of the damselflies. The top, now they're assembled and in position. This is how they might appear in the book, but the colors are, are all wrong. So for this male, the mid view right here, you see I've taken some photographs of parts of damselflies and I, I adopt those colors and then I start painting with those exact hues. And here, this is a male, or this is a female dorsal view and female lateral views. And you note that there are three different color morphs within the species. So I wanted to represent each of those. And a field guide is really nice because you can display them exactly the same side by side, pointing out the salient features that differ. So here's the final for one of the species, a leptobasis vasilans, and this is a male. And you'll see that there are glints off the eyes. There's a little bit of shading and subtle gleam glistening from the body. Um, all of that is just by design, right? It's uh, straightforward to do. Um, you can paint in missing parts. You can eliminate parts that are distracting. So that's what it was like. I could have drawn each by hand, but that would have been hundreds of illustrations. And, and if you figure, wow, that one isn't representative of the species, there needs to be more wax or more yellow. You can just change a layer. We also followed it up in this case with my mom to do a drawing for someone who's publishing a book on damselflies of Cuba, and this is thought to be an extinct species. So we had to work from just a wreckage of a specimen representing species that's thought to be extinct. In this case, we couldn't disassemble it. Second project. My friend Christian Robling was hunting around for ants in Brazil, Manaus, Brazil. And in the leaf litter, a three millimeter long ant bumped into his foot. He grabbed it, put it into a vial, immediately killed it, and looked at it and said, that's like no other ant I've ever seen. And Christian's seen just about every ant. So this is weird. He looked at it more and more and more, showed it to E.O. Wilson, and E.O. Wilson said, this ant looks like it must be from Mars. So they called it uh, Martialis Eureka. And it's, it was a dis great discovery, not just because it was a new species or a new genus, or even a new subfamily of the family of ants, but that subfamily placed it as the sister 
to all other ants. So a 100 year plus old mystery of where ants came from was, so let's say a lot of light was shed on it with this one single three millimeter long specimen. And it remains the only specimen of the species that's ever been preserved properly. Many have tried to look for it since, everyone has failed. So Christian called me up and he said, Barrett, we're going to overlap for two days. I need for you to draw this ant. Do you want to do it? This will be a really famous ant. I said, all right, that'll be fun. So he talked with me about it and I pulled out a notebook and I started sketching it. He told me what features were really important. He, he surmised what its behavior was like and he wanted me to visualize that as a subterranean burrowing blind ant. And so I, I did a cleaner drawing, thought, okay, in a tunnel, thought, wouldn't it, yeah, you could publish it like this maybe, but wouldn't it be cool to add textures and get real soil in there and make it feel more real? So I did, I started adding things to it, right? And uh, ultimately, you know, you see how small it is. It's this tiny thing, eyeless, pale, slightly larger front legs. So they said, yeah, that's a burrowing ant. Um, and so that went in the article with the discovery. Here's the third project. This project is about honeybees. And here is a bee, actually this is an, a giant Asian bee, Apis dorsata, gobbiting. And very few people have ever seen this, but it's a very common behavior. It just happens usually in the dark cavity of uh, Western honeybees nests. So they gather up the water and they stretch it out uh, from the, the crop and then they, they uh, use it for various things, cooling down the hive, whatever it may be. And so Tom Seeley, uh, Cornell Professor Emeritus, who's published a shelf full of books on honeybees, is publishing his last book on bees. And he asked me if I would draw this gobbiting behavior. And so we were talking about it side by side and thinking about it. And what I decided to do was take all the old imagery, like here's an old image that's terrible, doesn't really show gobbiting well. Here's another one that doesn't show it very well, but that's what exists really. And here's the image that Fred Dyer took of gobbiting. And we wanted to show it in Western honeybees inside a bee's nest. So I took dead bees, and I started positioning them under a microscope. I started stretching out the tongue-like mouth parts. And I took that photo and I saw, thought, okay, I can overlay on that and start drawing it. And I did a hairy drawing of one and, and started to go somewhere. I even pulled parts of an eye and stuck it in here and then started adding white. thought, okay, th this is my worksheet. And and then I decide, okay, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to draw the bee's head. I'm going to show that tongue-like mouth part and a water droplet there. And I, I sent it to Tom, and Tom said, you know what? People know that bees are hairy. I show hairy bees elsewhere. Let's focus on the gobbiting, the water droplet. So get rid of all the detail and focus on the salient features. So I did, and so I drew it like this, and then pen and ink. And then I started trying to show uh, that there was water and some three-dimensionality and coloration. Okay, we wanna put it in position, right? It's in a dark cavity and there's a background. You're going to have the cells, but come on, that looks totally goofy. It looks like an alien. So Tom looked at it and he, he agreed, this is horrible. We need to add hair. We need to make it hairy. Bees are hairy. So then I went to town and had a blast trying to make it uh, as realistic as I could with all the seedy or hair like structures. And it was fun for me because there's no better way to understand something that's tangible or observable than drawing it because you pay great attention to the smallest of details. And here I found all these bifurcating hairs, curved hairs, et cetera. It was a lot of fun. So that'll be the go-to image for gobbiting. 
And if you're interested, the book will be called B Works, and Tom's a really great writer. Okay, next project. Here's a video of a spider, a jumping spider. And this jumping spider might be asleep, according to Daniela Rusler et al. with this PNAS paper. It's twitching. The legs are curling up. And moreover, and I'll fast forward, see it twitching? Even the spinnerets are twitching. If you look at that and you know anything about sleep, or if you watch your housemate sleep, you'll know that, oh, and look, in this transparent individual, look at those. Oh, isn't that great? Those are the retinae, this is a retina, moving while the spider is twitching with curled legs. Tell me that doesn't look like rapid eye movement sleep. And that's what the authors are suggesting. Now, no spider has been shown to actually sleep yet, but this is on the road to being really convincing. And not only that, you've got this REM-like behavior. Well, I was asked to uh, review this paper, and I did. And I, I gave a lot of critical feedback, positive and I hope productive. And uh, Daniela was excited about my feedback. They were excited about my feedback and they asked me to write a, write a commentary. So I wrote a commentary for PNAS and, and it's, it's a good thing to have a visual. They highly recommend that you have a visual. I said, oh my gosh, I'm going to this meeting to meet Jess for the first time, right? Even though I didn't know it, that was the highlight of the meeting. And I knew I had essentially outside of that meeting, five days to write this commentary and produce the visual. So I went into hyper mode and wrote the commentary and decided to create a visual. Now, oh, I showed you it. I didn't want to show you it. I wanted to ask you, like, what would you show? And that could be an hour long discussion right there. So I'll just jump to it. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun? And this is just the preliminary. So I drew after a lot, a lot of sketching and figuring out what I wanted to do, I drew a sleeping mammal engaging in rapid eye movement sleep, a sleeping bird, a sleeping non-avian reptile, a lizard. And then, okay, you've got these vertebrates. And then on this phylogeny, so on this branch, you've got vertebrates. On this branch, now you've got cephalop mollusks, right? And you've got an octopus, which has been shown to not only sleep, but engage in a REM-like behavior. And now you've got this new discovery of a spider, a very distant relative. Is it engaging in rapid eye movement sleep? Well, I wanted to impart a few messages with a drawing. So I created a tree of relatedness to show you how spiders are way off to the side. Nobody's looked at any organism remotely closely related to it. Um, also size-wise, tiny. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have it hovering above the moon, right, in front of the moon, and maybe a nighttime sky background, and then add stars, and the, the actual EEGs during REM sleep of these three, and those are the actual REM uh, electroencephalogram readings for those three vertebrates. So the idea here is, okay, we've looked at electrophysiology of REM sleep here, a REM-like behavior, but no electrophysiology. And then there's this jumping spider. Whoa, right? Now note that the spider is smaller. The others are larger. My friend Damon Kylo and his daughter said, you know, you've got to make that spider bigger. And so the emphasis now shifts. And you see the sky is also highlighting the spider. So Design elements can make a huge difference. I, I mean, those retina, retina are not bright red, but here I make them bright red so you know what to look at. Okay, I didn't want to end without talking about the value of 3D for education, for original scientific research. So, because I saw a couple of your projects are really keen on doing 3D stuff. Well, the this one is a Blaschka wax model. And uh, so this wax, mo actually, no, this is a glass model. Blaschka glass, father and son team from the 19th century. 
and the famous Harvard Museum of Glass Flowers were amazing educational models of their time. But then you have got these waxes, anatomical waxes, and La Specula in Italy and other places. These were used for understanding anatomy, for dissection. You could actually dissect that female wax on the bottom there. And you go to natural history museums, they're fabrications. In this case, you've got uh, a bear, a brown bear, you've got an African elephant, and the insides are all clay initially and then cast and built from scratch with the real tusks there, and then overlaid with the actual skins. And other museums displaying skeletons, uh, magnified mosquito, uh, ungulates, uh, symbiotic association in a giant wax, dinosaur fossils, many of them actual fossils. I eat up natural history museums. I love them. So I worked uh, there for a while. And part of the thing I did was try to visualize. And on the lower right there, you see an adenovirus causes a common cold. And what I did was I worked with Molly Lenore to produce uh, 3D visuals, animations. Um, I mean, it was Molly, but I was doing uh, basically the conduit between the curation and the creation, the design. And the value of looking at these scales is omni-important. And we built them, as I said. We build these models for display and understanding of these tiny creatures. And I built organisms, all kinds of organisms for natural history museums around the world. Uh, and it, it was a lot, a lot of fun. Did it for years. And I've applied those same techniques to producing frogs for science. So I collaborated with a team of behavioral researchers. And Ryan Taylor gave a talk once. His is the photo of the real frog on the top. And he said during the talk, man, I really could use a realistic model because he had made a plaster model and blew up a condom <laughs> as a vocal sack and the condom would blow up and it wouldn't work very well. And so I came up to him and I said, hey, Ryan, uh, nice to meet you, loved your talk. I've made fake frogs and I've got a friend who works on animatronics if you want us to help you with it. And so we did and we worked together for years and we ended up working on the science together. Now, how to do that uh, well, first I'll say the science was fascinating and the frogs as robots opened up new avenues of research, questions you couldn't dare address, impossible to manipulate in real systems you could examine in terms of mate selection or sexual selection. So here's some figures, here's another where you can analyze things based on whether or not you have a model frog singing versus just a recording. And making those frogs, what I would do is I'd take, say, a real frog in bits and mold and cast those bits, add legs, sculpt a prototype, mold in uh, two parts the body, the feet in one part using hot melt glue that I shot in that silicone mold, cut them very carefully up with sewing scissors, attach them to the bodies, drill through that body. That's where the, the vocal sac is going to go. Make screws here. And this, this frog is about a centimeter long. It's really tiny. And then uh, airbrush base coats. And then maybe, maybe two centimeters. And then uh, paint it with oil paints and acrylics to look somewhat real. And then I used silicone, oh, what is that called? that goes in people's bodies and can survive for months. Oh, I forgot. Anyway, we blew them up. I painted those with stretchable paints, automotive paints. And then through the floor of the sound chamber, uh, we would blow these up with uh, calls. And then you'd have this frog that would <laughs> call females. <laughs> and the female would invariably choose the calling male if it had a complex call. Now here she's wondering like, what is up with this male? He should be mounting me. And she's perplexed at that point. But anyway, making models uh, can be a viable pursuit 
Facsimiles can help you address new questions in biology. So I, I wanted to leave this open. I hope we have time together because I wanted to think about your challenges. And I've only shown you a few projects I've worked on with a few media or a few approaches, but maybe we could think about other approaches if you have time that might benefit you guys.